Baltimore City State's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, not guilty of the federal mortgage fraud, but guilty of the longboat key charge. Not guilty of the Kissimmee one, but guilty of the longboat key one. This comes after more than six hours of deliberations today. According to prosecutors, the former city state's attorney lied to secure a better mortgage interest rate on two vacation homes in Florida. Throughout the trial, Mosby and her entire team have maintained she did not knowingly lie on the mortgage forms, but the jury has ultimately decided that she did lie on at least one of those. Right, right now, we're joined by defense attorney Kurt Nachman. Uh, so, Kurt, again, you've been following this case. What is your thought? Kind of like a split decision here, guilty on one count, not guilty on another. Definitely a split decision. It may have come down to the fact that, um, you know, her husband testified that certain things were taken care of in a certain time frame, um, you know, without knowing exactly and not having all the evidence in front of me. The timing of when those homes were purchased may have been critical to the juror's decision um, to find her guilty of one count and then not the other. A really astute jury, though, to be able to take the minutia of all of these uh, mortgage documents and everything and to really look and to be able to see that there was a difference in this. What do you think the, the slight variation was? Yeah, sometimes you, you look into uh, jurors' decision making processes, and every time I've spoken to a juror after the fact, um, win, lose, or draw on a case, um, I always walk away sort of shaking my head because jurors often pick up on things that either you didn't think were an issue at all or you thought was, you know, uh, even the other side in the case, you know, didn't think was a big deal. So it's really hard to say what the jurors may have focused on um, in this particular case. Hey, Kurt, who's this a victory for? The prosecution, the defense, and then... What, what, was, what does sentencing look like here? Yeah, so um, first of all, it's, it's a victory for the prosecution in the sense that they got the conviction, they secured a conviction in the case. It's a victory for the defense in that she wasn't convicted on both counts, although I'm sure Ms. Mosby was hoping to be not convicted on either count. Exactly. Um, so, lo yeah, losing on anything is, is certainly going to be um, um, critical. And you Kurt, know, right it, now, we, if it's okay, we're going to toss it yeah. right to Mackenzie Frost. She's outside the courthouse with the latest on this split verdict. Mackenzie? Yeah, Mary, so we could hear Marilyn Mosby actually start to sob in between each verdict as it was being read inside the courtroom. And really, the jury was polled, and they unanimously decided that it was the gift letter that Marilyn Mosby signed, indicating that her now ex-husband, Nick Mosby, was the one to gift her the $5,000. The jury deciding that was the lie, and that's how they arrived at the decision to find her guilty for the Longboat Key uh, mortgage fraud charge. Now, they found her not guilty of the Simi property and really we've gone through so many different mortgage applications and all of these documents and I heard you Mary earlier talking about how the jury was really able to go through the minutia of some of this evidence and that's clearly what they were doing in the hours that it took them to deliberate and arrive at this verdict. Yeah and so Mackenzie what happens now we were talking with Kurt Nachman a second ago I asked him who's this a victory for because in this instance Unlike the first trial, she's guilty on, on everything here. This one's kind of split. Now, a, a pellet situation aside, what do you think sentencing might look like yeah. here? Well, we know that she faces the, you know, the maximum is 30 years for each charge, one charge now 30 years. It's probably unlikely that she will get sentenced to 30 years in prison. And we'll have to wait and see what the appellate situation looks like. We know that she, her defense team has indicated that they do plan to file an appeal for the perjury charge, although that hasn't happened yet. So now we're waiting for everyone to come outside and potentially ask them if there will be another appellate moves in this case as well. Mackenzie, you were at this trial every single day. It lasted, you know, four weeks or, or more. Um, this was the first time that Marilyn Mosby took the stand to tell her story. Yes. It was messy about, you know, her marriage and maybe her, her ex-husband's financial situation. Did, do you think that helped, though, in this case? At least jurors heard from her in some capacity. 
I mean, I think that's definitely what the defense was aiming at, right, Mary? We heard from Marilyn herself who say that she uh, regretted not taking the stand in the perjury trial, and so she wanted to take the stand in this one to make sure that the jury heard her truth. Now, whether or not her truth lines up with the reality of what happened doesn't really matter at this point, given the, the jury has decided their verdict in here. But I think that after leaving it all on the field, that's a question we certainly will ask them when they come out if she regrets that decision or she thinks that it helped. Mackenzie, I know you had to get downstairs. Has, has Judge Grigsby instructed Ms. Mosby uh, to do anything at this point, unless it's already happened, rendering her passport, not leaving the state, anything of that nature? Not that I'm aware of, uh, to be honest with you, Kai and Mary, as soon as the verdict was read and we listened to the polling of the jurors, I, I bolted and came outside right. so I could provide the update for uh, everyone sure. at home. But we'll have to wait and see exactly the details of what happens next. I think there will be a lot of conversations about the appeals process and then potentially setting a sentencing date. But again, there's a lot that needs to happen before we get to that point. And, and Mackenzie, Kurt Nogman pointed out something interesting, and Mary and I both chimed in on it, was that in this case, and you covered the whole thing, as Mary mentioned. Judge, Judge Grigsby really did seem to bend over backwards to accommodate the defense in almost forecasting any possible appellate situations. Yep. And the big, the big victory, of course, of the defense was that change of venue. Kai, I'm going to cut you yes, off because sure. it looks like they're coming out, oh, so stay thank with you. us Go here. Ahead. I'm going to talk to you if you can still hear me, yes, Kai. We can. I can. Go ahead. I can answer your question. I can. I can answer your question about, you know, it, it does seem, though, that the, the judge really made it a point to try and make sure that everything is it was following the rules, making sure that the defense pretty much got everything that they were asking for within reason. I mean, we're in Greenbelt because the defense made the appeal to move this out of Baltimore two different times. So now here we are. So it does feel like the, the appellate conversation seemed to play or w at least weigh on the judge's mind throughout this entire entire process. Now, I will tell you that we did just see Marilyn Mosby's uh, SUV pull up here uh, just on the side of me down the steps. So we do anticipate her exiting the courthouse momentarily. Um, well, just, just kind of bear with me here for a yep. second if we can just and wait a little bit longer. I don't know if Mary Absolutely. or Kai, you have any other and questions we know uh, for me, but I yeah, we know that Marilyn Mosby had supporters there yesterday. There was a prayer circle. Are there supporters there? Yes. And then also, I'm wondering, as we wait for her to come out of the courthouse in Greenbelt tonight, there was some to do about some remarks that the court staff was making, negative remarks about her. They were worried that perhaps the jury yes. may have heard that offensive comments. Did that come up at all today? And do you think that's going to be an issue? or the judge is just not going to deal with it? No, I don't think it'll be an issue anymore. The judge did bring it up uh, yesterday, and it does appear as if that was one of the issues that was being discussed during the sealed session, to much of the media's frustration because we weren't allowed to know what was going on. But from what we understand now, there were some comments made by a few different court staff that were disparaging of Marilyn Mosby or this case. The judge heard about it, the defense heard about it, and the judge, Judge Grigsby, said she was shocked to learn about it. She said that. It really hasn't happened. Now, the defense asked the judge to pull each juror if they had heard those comments, but Judge Grigsby said no, she didn't want to do that because she was afraid by asking them that would, in fact, if they didn't hear anything about it, that would put that idea in their head. Now, in terms of supporters here today, we do have uh, some supporters from Marilyn Mosby. She's been arriving with a handful each time. Yesterday, there was a large group today, not quite as large, but still pretty <laughs> significant um, here as we wait for her. There's a few supporters waiting outside as well. So we'll have to wait and see if there will be any sort of comments from her or the prosecutors or um, the defense attorneys or anything. Right. And Mackenzie, I think we want to try because we still don't see Ms. Mosby. We're going to give you a, a little bit of a break, you and your photographer, and try and bring Kurt Nachman in. And just in terms of his audio, Kurt, you can still hear me and Mary? I can. Thanks. And so we're wondering with three guilty verdicts, what kind of time could Ms. Mosby face here? Yeah, I mean, I would suspect anywhere from 18 to 24 months um, based on the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, you know, one of the things we need to figure out is it, that, that I personally haven't calculated under the sentencing guidelines is how the counts stack. And then, of course, she would get diminution credits or credit 
for accepting responsibility, and obviously she had a trial, so those credits are gone. Um, but I would anticipate anywhere from 18 to 24 months. And Kurt, uh, defendants like Marilyn Mosby, a former city state's attorney, uh, what does the federal prison look like for her? I know we saw it with Catherine Pugh and, of course, uh, years prior at Norris. Right. So Ms. Mosby, more likely than not, would be um, work camp eligible. Um, so, you know, the facilities are actually, uh, all things being considered, um, not the worst um, that you could imagine. Um, you know, that, that she would be in with other white collar type inmates. Um, but make no mistake, prison is prison, right? And, and, you know, they're not places where you get to leave. They're not places where you get to be unsupervised. They're not places where you get to do what you want and go where you want when you want. And, and so certainly, um, you know, those are all going to be factors that are going to be playing through Ms. Mosby's mind at this juncture, undoubtedly. And again, sentencing dates have not yet been set. There are two separate trials right. here and two separate verdicts. Kurt, I just want to see if you can clarify, is it 18 to 24 months on each count or total putting the, two, the three counts together from two trials? Yeah, uh, so that's something I, I calculated uh, 18 to 24 months after the last verdict. I would need to go back and run, rerun new sentencing guidelines based on this current verdict. And whether what I don't know without looking it up in the federal sentencing guidelines manual is whether or not the counts stack upon one another. So that's a, a good question. I believe that the top end would stack. So in other words, the judge would have a higher range at the top end of the guidelines. Um, but that's something I'd have to actually sit down and calculate based on the offense charge and what she was found guilty of. Yeah, uh, Kurt, we, we look, look at the kind of the macro, the big picture here. We, we've had uh, some very aggressive U.S. attorneys here uh, in the state of Maryland with this, uh, Eric Barron, Rod Rosenstein in the past, and they have uh, very aggressively said and have gone after corruption, uh, whether it's at the state level the local level and whether it's Baltimore or the state of Maryland, this state sadly does have a history of corruption. What is this what does this say to those who, who might commit acts that are that are against the law uh, and to those who might know what the law is and and commit an act anyway? Well, I certainly think that yet again it's going to send a message to individuals who choose to run for public office that whether you like it or not, you are held to a higher degree of, of scrutiny both in your personal life and in your public life. Um, and, and you know, you can look long through the history of, of counties throughout the state of Maryland, and particularly in Baltimore, um, you know, of individuals who have been charged with different crimes. And, you know, there's a high level of scrutiny. Um, and, and, you know, it's definitely something we gotta look at. And we're just watching people leave the courtroom, some Marilyn Mo Mosby supporters, and we do Ms. see Marilyn Mosby. Mosby. Can you say anything? Uh, 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 Ms. Mosby, how do you well. feel about this split verdict? Leave alone. Ms. Mosby, do you are you are you happy with the decision to take the stand? No comment. No comment. No comment. No comment. You got enough, thank you. Go. Ms. Mosby, what's your comment to the people of Baltimore? No comment. No comment. Mary and Kai, if you can hear me, that was Marilyn Mosby obviously not making any comments there to the supporters or the media. You can hear some of the supporters now chanting, We love her, we love her. Love. Miss Mosby did not say anything as she was surrounded by a sea of supporters on her way out of the courthouse. Mr. Wyda, do you have a comment? We're doing the right thing. We're doing That's a public defender in the case. Thank you very much. Mr. Wyda? James Wyda. That's Maryland public defender. No comment from. James White, a Marilyn Mosby's federal public defender in this case, just making his way out of the courthouse now, not saying anything or indicating as to the possible next steps in this case now. Um, Casey, yeah, we, we don't need to follow them into the parking lot, but we can just say that 
Obviously, emotions are very high right now for everyone involved in this case. Marilyn Mosby, again, not making any public comments, but we did hear her starting to cry. She let out some sobs after each verdict as they were read inside the courtroom. And now the big question, Mary and Kai, is what happens next? We're waiting on potential appeals to be filed for the perjury conviction, as well as sentencing dates that could possibly be set. So while today is wrapping up, we still have a long ways to go in this in this story. All right, Mackenzie Frost reporting live from Greenbaum. Mackenzie, you have done an outstanding job yeah. uh, bringing very critical, important information. Thank to you and thanks to Casey, uh, who's behind the camera right now. But we do appreciate you and all of our crews who've been out there trying to cover this uh, for our viewers. We truly appreciate it. And we have much more coverage on the Maryland Thank you. verdict from federal court right after this break. Stay with us. Live from WBFF-TV in Baltimore, this is Breaking News. Ms. Mosby, how do you feel no about comment, this split verdict? No Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Ms. Mosby, do you, are, you, are you happy with the decision to take the stand? No comment. No comment. No comment. No comment. You got enough. Thank you. Marilyn Mosby walking out of court just minutes ago after a split verdict in her federal mortgage fraud case, making no comments to the media, her supporters surrounding her, her federal public defender also with no comment at this time. A federal jury finds former city state's attorney Marilyn Mosby guilty of one count of mortgage fraud and not guilty of the other. Thank you for staying with us. I'm Mary Bubala. We have team coverage tonight of this split verdict and how we got to this point. We're going to go right back to Fox 25's Mackenzie Frost outside the federal courthouse in Greenbelt with more. Mackenzie. 
Yeah, Mary, we could see the emotions from a lot of the supporters with Marilyn Mosby as they all made their way outside of this courthouse today following that split verdict. No comment from pretty much everyone involved in this case right now. But the jury deciding that Marilyn Mosby, the former top prosecutor in Baltimore City, did in fact lie on one mortgage application and the jury unanimously deciding that it came down to that gift letter that we have seen introduced and discussed throughout this entire trial time and time again. It was that gift letter that Nick Mosby signed as well as Marilyn Mosby indicating that Nick was going to give Marilyn the extra $5,000 she needed to secure a favorable interest rate before she bought that condo in Longboat Key, Florida. Now that money, according to the FBI forensic account, was not in Nick's money. It actually came from Marilyn's bank account who then wired it to Nick and then from there he shuffled it around and gave it to the lender. Throughout this entire trial, and it has been four weeks, the jury has heard testimony and hours worth of testimony in this case now. And after the verdicts were read, Marilyn Mosby, you could hear her audibly start to sob. She let out a cry after each verdict was read. Now we have to wait and see the next steps. We do know that she has indicated she plans to appeal the perjury conviction that came back in November. It's unclear what will happen next. We asked Marilyn's public defender, James Wida, but he did not make any public comments. And then we have to look at the potential for sentencing, and those dates have yet to be scheduled. Mary? And Mackenzie, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, Marilyn Mosby taking the stand in her own defense this trial, yeah. and she didn't do it in her first federal trial. Do you think that made a bit of difference at all? It's hard to say exactly what made a difference or what landed with the jury, but it was interesting to hear Marilyn Mosby take the stand under oath, tell the jury kind of the messy side of her marriage and the finances and about how she believed Nick Mosby, now her ex-husband, when he said he was taking care of the tax lien. And those conversations were taking place before she bought the property in Kissimmee, Florida, and that's the mortgage application fraud charge that she was found not guilty on. When it comes to Longboat Key one, the gift letter is where the jury says that they did not believe her, but Marilyn says that she wanted to take the stand this time because she wanted to be able to tell her truth. She said it was something that she regretted not doing in the perjury case. Now she left it all on the field, and here are the results. All right, Mackenzie Frost reporting live tonight in Greenbelt for us tonight and throughout the duration of this four-week trial. We appreciate it. Joining us to weigh in on this verdict and what comes next is attorney Kurt Nachman. Kurt, you're not associated with this trial, but you've really been helping us digest some of what has happened in the past couple of weeks and today. Does this verdict, this split verdict, surprise you? Um, a little bit, it does surprise me. It, it shows me clearly the jurors were listening, that they keyed in on, on the one particular note and that maybe they did believe Ms. Mosby's testimony that she really did trust at the time her husband was taking care of the finances. Um, obviously, did not believe them at all with regard to the, uh, the gift note um, that, that sort of highlighted that one purchase of, of the Longboat Key property. Sentencing, of course, comes next for Marilyn Mosby, even though she says she's going to appeal. She will be sentenced for both this case and her perjury case. What kind of prison time is she looking at? Yeah, so I actually, while we were on the break, I ran, re-ran her guidelines. The guidelines on the perjury is 15 to 21 months. Um, the guidelines on the mortgage fraud is zero to six months. So we've got a couple of different things going on. We've got some grouping. We've got some potential stacking. Um, as you can imagine, there are reams and reams of continuing education for lawyers as to how these are gonna play out. But ultimately, the defense team is gonna argue that these are the same transactions or similar transactions, and so the sentencing guidelines should be reduced. And the uh, federal prosecutors are gonna argue that they should be increased and because they are separate incidents, separate transactions, and they should all be on top of one another. Um, and so ultimately, the judge is going to decide how those sentencing guidelines are applied. I would suspect that we land somewhere between 18 and 24 months. We've learned a lot about Nick Mosby's finances throughout this case. Now that Marilyn Mosby has been found guilty on one of these mortgage fraud charges, what do you think comes next for the city council president? And when you answer that, I also want you just to make an observation. You likely know Marilyn Mosby about this power couple's fall from grace. Marilyn Mosby now guilty of in, in a federal trial and Nick Mosby, his financial woes and also admitting to lying to the public about it. 
Yeah, well, I certainly hope that he's handling the city's finances or in uh, being a watchdog on the city finances better than he is in his own household. Um, that's that's obvious, number one. Number two, it was fascinating to me that he testified without any sort of immunity. Um, you know, he certainly placed himself in significant jeopardy. Um, you know, federal prosecutors are going to view that dimly. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see how things pan out. Obviously, he had counsel throughout this entirety of this process, um, whether or not that continues moving forward and whether or not federal prosecutors, um, you know, federal prosecutors certainly don't take lightly to individuals coming in and admitting to significant financial crimes on the witness stand. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. And appeals aside, Kurt, what does it look like in terms of where Marilyn Mosby, what kind of federal prison does she go to? Yeah, so there's a camp in New Jersey that, that's a likely um, outcome for her. I mean, I wouldn't expect her to be shipped, you know, across the United States. Um, that's typically reserved for violent individuals who are involved in gang-related activity. She's more likely than not going to be in a war camp. Um, it, it'll, uh, again, it'll be a relatively nice environment for prison. Um, but make no mistake, it's prison. Uh, it's not a fun place to be. You don't get to go where you want, do what you want, and you're obviously under constant supervision, um, you know, throughout the process. So, you know, certainly um, that's going to be something that's going to be weighing on her mind. It is sad for her, her children, and her ex-husband for sure. She also faces disbarment in Maryland, losing her law license as well. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And my understanding is that she asked for a stay pending the outcome of this case. Um, I. I think the Court of Appeals, or excuse me, the Supreme Court now of the state of Maryland is, is going to view dimly that, uh, that request for a stay. And quickly, the appeal process, that will draw this out a little bit, but you think the, the judge in this case has done everything that she could to keep it uh, in the, the legal parameters of, of what she needs to do? Absolutely. Um, the judge moved the case to Greenbelt. The judge granted severance. The judge gave her every opportunity to testify or not testify in both cases. Um, so Judge Grigsby definitely bent over backwards to give the defendant as fair a, pos a, fair a trial as, as humanly possible or as justiciably possible. Kurt Nachman, we couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much for your insight on all of this. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to take a look back at the timeline of this case. On January 13th, 2022, Marilyn Mosby was indicted on perjury and fraud charges. Marilyn Mosby maintained her innocence for nearly two years leading up to her first trial. It was set for May of 2022, but it was delayed multiple times. Despite her insistence, she wanted a speedy trial. What I'm asking for is that I be tried right now. Put this on trial right now so I can prove my innocence. In January of 2023, Mosby's entire defense team asked to withdraw from her case, citing scheduling conflicts. The judge allowed them to leave, and Marilyn Mosby was appointed public defenders. Last February, the trial was delayed for a third time to allow Mosby's public defenders, they are federal, to get up to speed on this case. The trial finally began in late October of last year and ended on November 9th with a guilty verdict. Fox 45 News has been covering the federal case against Marilyn Mosby for more than a year. Our coverage will continue on Fox 45 News tonight at 10 with in-depth analysis of the verdict and what comes next for Baltimore's former top prosecutor. You can find all of our past reporting on foxbaltimore.com. This morning, a Baltimore City Circuit Court judge ruled Tristan Jackson's court proceedings will remain open to the public. The judge in this case also denying the 18-year-old's request to be transferred to a juvenile facility. Fox 45's Rebecca Pryor has details. Yeah, these were two big wins for the prosecution today. Ultimately, the judge agreeing with their argument that Jackson was 18 at the time of his alleged crimes and deserves to be treated as such under the law. Meanwhile, the defense continues to push for juvenile protections despite Jackson's age. What court proceedings the public is privy to concerning 18-year-old Tristan Jackson up for debate inside the Mitchell Courthouse Tuesday. 
as one of the accused gunmen behind the devastating Brooklyn Day mass shooting. Jackson awaits trial for a laundry list of violent charges, including more than two dozen counts of attempted and conspiracy to commit murder. Due to the severity of his alleged crimes and the sheer number of victims, the state pushing to retain the public's access to information involving his case as the defense pushes to place it behind closed doors. Although no specific threats or concerns were detailed, the defense arguing the public's knowledge of where Jackson is being detained poses a safety risk to him and his family. The defense also accusing the state of leaking misinformation to the media. Defense attorney Lauren Dollar saying, quote, they're using this to try to grow animus against our client and taint the jury pool, your honor, which is inappropriate. Prosecutor Michael Dunty responding with, quote, they are asking this court to control what the media puts out there and and that's not this court's role at all. City State's attorney Ivan Bates also refuting the allegations with a statement of his own, reading in part, quote, the fact that they would attack my staff and me personally for simply doing our jobs and protecting public safety is highly inappropriate. I think it is very important that the residents see and understand and hear firsthand what's going on. Attorney and legal expert Euripsy Morgan, who has no direct ties to this case, says considering the tragedy that occurred, the Brooklyn community deserves transparency. It would prevent the people in those communities from feeling safe again and knowing that the criminal justice system is doing everything it can to make sure that the perpetrators of that crime are being dealt with effectively. Ultimately, Judge Jennifer Schiffer agreeing. One of the foundations of our system is that access to a public criminal trial enhances the integrity of the criminal justice system, said Schiffer, denying the request to seal court records. The defense then making the motion to transfer Jackson to a juvenile facility to pair him with educational and mental health services he's not allotted in the adult system. This is an 18 year old. This is a legal adult. Why would we even be discussing um, having an adult be put into a juvenile system? Both Morgan and the state calling the request illogical and absurd. This is somebody has proven that, you know, they cannot be out in society with everyone else and maintain the safety of the community. Assisting in the decision making, Assistant Attorney General for Juvenile Services, Antonio Rivera, advising Judge Schiffer she does not have the authority to guarantee Jackson would remain detained under DJS supervision. With that in mind, Schiffer denying the transfer, citing clear and convincing evidence and her duty to protect public safety. Now, among the evidence that we already know the state plans to present, Police say that Jackson was seen several times on surveillance video, spraying shots into fleeing crowds. Police also saying that GPS coordinates from a DJS ankle monitor that Jackson had on from a prior offense place him at the scene of the crime. Reporting from the Mitchell Courthouse, Rebecca Pryor, Fox 45 News. I'm Atrell Nashar in Washington with why a federal appeals court says former President Trump is not immune from prosecution in the 2020 election subversion case. Getting chilly tonight. Once again, we're going to drop below freezing, clear skies, nice and quiet for now, but we're going to see temperatures on the rise. Could we really hit 60 degrees? That is definitely a possibility. We're going to go over that and talk about this active pattern returning and whether or not it's going to impact your weekend.
Am I talking to Mary? All right, let's talk about what is coming our way. Good evening. I think for the most part, it has been a pretty easy to handle forecast the past uh, weekend through today and even tomorrow. It's been a lot of the same, very much a record that's been broken when we're talking about uh, the one that just plays the same thing over and over and over again. So. 38 degrees is where we're sitting right now. Temperatures are uh, going to just continue to chill down tonight. We'll likely get below freezing once again. And I think from here on out, we're going to start seeing it trend a whole lot more upward. So get ready to see things a little warmer, a little milder as we head in the next several days. 50s are going to feel pretty nice as we move into your Wednesday. Lots more sunshine to come your way. Thursday is going to have a few clouds to move across the area, but not enough to stop our temperatures from warming up. We're talking still mid 50s. Look at this trend we're going to be on fun ride up the hill to around 61 degrees by Saturday. We are going to come back down again as we head into next week, very likely here, but uh, at least that stays well above our average there 45 until we get into next week, next seven days. Enjoy this now. We are not going to exactly be perfectly sunny the entire time. So that's the one thing we're going to be tracking here. Uh, part of that is because this system out here in California is going to be tracking across the eastern United States. It will be bringing us a chance for uh, cloud cover. I think the chance for any rainfall is slim to none from this system. But there are chances coming here. First, the colder air is going to start to dissipate away as we move in the next several days. We're going to be watching uh, the temperatures warming up in response to some more southerly and southwesterly winds. Now, this is the next system we're watching. It's developing way down into the Gulf. What happens after Sunday is going to be a little bit of question mark here. Watch what happens. Now, this is the American model putting that system very near Baltimore. This would bring us some cold rain, maybe some mountain snowflakes, but that's about it. But here's the bottom line on things. We have low confidence that exactly what those track of this storm is going to be and the impacts that it will bring. I think wintry precipitation appears very unlikely, though, but changes to that forecast are very likely. So stay tuned. And we're going to have the 10 day forecast for you to kind of talk about things a little further into the weekend just a bit. A federal appeals court rules former President Trump is not immune from prosecution in the criminal case alleging he tried to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Sinclair National Correspondent Atra Al Nashar joins us live with more on the ruling and what could come next. Good evening, Atra. Hey, good evening, Mary. The former president is expected to appeal the decision to the Supreme Court. And as we've seen in the hours since this decision came down, he is not abandoning a defense that three federal judges say has no standing. A major blow to former President Trump's defense in special counsel Jack Smith's election subversion case dealt unanimously by a federal appeals court. They write, we cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power, the recognition and implementation of election results. I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. The court disagrees, writing, instead of inhibiting the president lawful discretionary action, the prospect of federal criminal liability might serve as a structural benefit to deter possible abuses of power and criminal behavior. Trump has until Monday to appeal this to the Supreme Court. Former U.S. Attorney John Fishwick. I expect they're going to say he doesn't have immunity and that they're going to do it on an expedited basis. Trump faces four felony charges in this case, two for allegedly conspiring to defraud the United States through claims about the 2020 election Trump knew were false and attempting to oppress, threaten and intimidate Americans from voting and having their vote counted. And two charges for allegedly obstructing and attempting to obstruct official proceedings to certify election results. Assuming the Supreme Court also says no, Trump does not have immunity because he was president. What else could his team use as a defense? The primary one appears to be that they're going to say, look, the former president was advised by lawyers. They gave him the green light to do many of the things that he could. He did uh, connected to January 6th. They'll also say he had a First Amendment right to say certain things. I think a First Amendment argument is probably going to be uphill. Trump's political allies quick to echo a claim he's made many times before. I believe that they've been after uh, President Trump for partisan political purposes. I think that's obvious. 
Now, the judge in this case, Tanya Chutkin, recently scrapped the trial's original March 4th start date to wait for the higher courts to rule on Trump's immunity claim. So now that we've got this appeals court ruling, she is expected to assign a new date as soon as we learn how or if the Supreme Court weighs in. Back to you. All right, Ultra El Nishar reporting live for us tonight in D.C. Thank you. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. What a difference a day makes. The fog was so thick in Green Bay on Sunday, you could only see the tops of a few wind turbines. Throughout the day, the fog lifted out and fell back until the heat of the daytime sun helped it evaporate. And here's an unusual sight, rainbow sherbet colors filling the sky during sunset over a lake near Rochester, New York. Listen to Off the Radar, new episodes every Tuesday. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Janae Bones in Washington with a look at a college requiring students to turn in SAT and ACT scores again after hundreds of colleges dropped the mandate during COVID. Some colleges and universities across the country are now reinstating standardized testing requirements after the COVID-19 pandemic put, put tests like the SAT on pause. And tonight's Assignment America, the National Desk's Janae Bowens explains how it could impact students. The COVID-19 pandemic meant schools were closed and things like SAT exam dates canceled. So hundreds of colleges and universities waived standardized testing requirements and many have kept that policy in place. But with Dartmouth now requiring standardized test scores, experts think more schools will follow. What if I mess it up again? The Perfect Score is a 2004 movie about how six students set out to steal the answers to the SAT so they were sure to get into college and avoid what they call failure. These people, they're messing with the rest of our lives. The pressure to do well might be what a lot of students from the class of 2029 are feeling now that Dartmouth has required them to submit standardized test scores after making it optional in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's really the only fair way to compare all students equally. 
The CEO of College Prep Genius, Jean Burke, says she's not surprised by the move and thinks it's necessary. A 4.0 at one high school is not the same at another. Every school calculates their scores differently. So they have to have some numerical component that's common to all applicants. Now the student newspaper, the Dartmouth reports, a faculty research group found standardized test scores are an important predictor of a student's success, regardless of a student's background or family income. They also say they miss out on great applicants when they don't have the test scores. Now, standardized testing has been accused of being biased, especially since black and Latino students have historically scored lower on the math section of the SAT. Now, Dartmouth says the test scores will be examined and used in the process only in the framing of the environment that the applicant is coming from. In Washington, Janae Bowens. All right, here's a look. 10 day forecast. We talked about those temperatures rising up as we move into the next several days. Upper 50s Friday near 60 on Saturday. We'll see small chances of rain. And once we get later into the weekend, likely Sunday into Monday, we're watching for a potential storm system to develop right in here. These numbers could change in the coming days, so stay tuned. We will see how it's going to shape up into Wednesday and Thursday as well. But likely we're going to see those temperatures coming back down again. Enjoy those 60s. And by the way, make sure you come out and say hello to me. I'll be out there along with many of us from Fox 45 at the Health Expo in the Baltimore uh, Convention Center on Saturday. Gerard, thanks. Well, finally tonight, the National Aquarium is working to raise awareness about climate change and rising water temperatures in the harbor. Be More Lifestyle's Mark Clark shows us how. We're at the National Aquarium. We're talking about climate change and who better to do it than Megan. Megan, you said you could break it down in like one minute, right? Yes. Can you do that for us? Sure, happy to. So as humans, as we go on with our lives, we power our lives, our homes, um, we are burning fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas. And as we burn those fossil fuels, they are adding carbon dioxide to our atmosphere. Uh, that carbon dioxide goes into our atmosphere and builds up very much like adding layers to a blanket. Hmm. Um, we call this kind of the heat trapping blanket effect. So it's uh, as we burn more and more, we're adding more and more carbon dioxide, that blanket builds up and the Earth's heat simply just can't get out. Um, so we're trapping in the Earth's heat and the planet is getting warmer and that is leading to climate change. And that leads to climate change and so we're trying to figure out how we cool down that effect, that blanket in effect. Yeah, it starts with our actions on land. So it starts with our actions on land. Well, thank you for breaking that down perfectly. Appreciate Happy you. <laughs> I'm Mark Clark, Fox 45 News. And that is all for Fox 45 News at 6. Family Feud is next. Of course, we'll see you back here for the news at 10 tonight with more on the Marilyn Mosby uh, split verdict today in court. Good night.
Good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Bubala. Marilyn Mosby has been found guilty of one count of mortgage fraud. The former city state's attorney was facing two charges stemming from multiple home purchases in Florida. The jury deciding Mosby was guilty of fraud when purchasing the Longboat Key home, but not the home she bought in Kissimmee, Florida. Mosby is facing up to 30 years in prison for that single guilty charge. She also is set to be sentenced for two perjury charges in a separate case. A Baltimore man was sentenced to life in prison today for the murder of a child. Devon Battle was found guilty of shooting at a car on East Fayette back uh, <clears throat> in 2022, killing 13-year-old Kelsey Washington. In a statement, the city state's attorney Ivan Bates says while he's happy with the verdict, it's impossible to bring back the victim whose life was cut short by battle. Bates also saying sentences like this are key in making sure criminals know gun violence will not be tolerated in Baltimore. Weekly recycling is set to make its return to Baltimore. According to the Department of Public Works, weekly pickups will begin in March. DPW says it's able to bring back normal services due to an expansion of its workforce and upgrading its fleet of waste disposal vehicles. It has been years since the city had weekly recycling, which was originally suspended during the pandemic. Now meteorologist Gerard Jabaley has a look at the forecast. Thank you, Mary. Tonight it's going to be quite another chilly one. We're talking about temperatures back around freezing. More sunshine as we move through your Wednesday. Don't expect it to be much colder for much longer. That's the good news. We are going to be back to around 50 degrees for your high on Wednesday. Thursday will be even a little bit warmer. This beautiful weather is going to start breaking down in the coming days here. We will watch our temperatures rise up quite a bit. So some good news we will reach near 60 degrees by Saturday, well above our average high around 45. In fact, the next several will We'll stay that way until around Tuesday when we will likely see things cooling down a bit out west. We are tracking a storm system way out in California. That one may bring us our first chance of some light rainfall, if anything. But first, we're going to see our temperatures recovering as the system arrives later into the week. But we're likely talking well, by Friday, Saturday before we'll see any chances of rain even beginning to return. Saturday has a small chance late in the day. Better chances as we move into early next week with another storm system that will likely take shape and head up right along the east coast is the way things are shaping up now, but that could change a lot in the coming days. So stay tuned. Bottom line, we have low confidence of exactly those tracks and impacts that this uh, storm was going to bring, but rent tree precipitation appears pretty unlikely in the Baltimore area, but changes to the forecast are certainly likely in the coming days. So tomorrow around 49 degrees, maybe into the 50s in a few spots. We'll be looking several days ahead where we will be likely seeing those temperatures warming up and then the rain chances early next week.
that out. Pause it here. Delete out this. Can't give it a wall away, despite what uh, the red hot chili peppers suggest. Okay, let's do this. <clears throat> give it away, give it away, give it away now. Went too fast, one second. Too fast. Back it up. Ah, sorry, I keep clicking too fast. Jumping ahead. One. Okay. One more, that should do it. Okay, 10 seconds. On the dot, 10, 10 seconds, or? Okay. This is running uh, tonight before the 10, right? Okay, got it. All right, three, two, one. A shift in our weather pattern appears likely as we head later into next weekend. Oh, not next weekend, I already messed that up this weekend, later into next week. My fault. All right, take two, three, two, one. A shift in our pattern is likely. We're going to see a storm system developing down into the Gulf, and it will likely head up the eastern seaboard. What impacts will it bring us here in Baltimore, and when will it arrive? We'll have all the details coming up. Faster, harder. Okay. Just want to know your your style. Okay. Three, two, one. A shift in the pattern is likely. I'm tracking a storm system down in the Gulf. It's going to be headed up to Baltimore. We'll talk about the impacts and when it will hit coming up. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabele. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. More of this pattern that we are continuing with little to nothing to talk about except a rise in our temperatures. We are not going to see much on the satellite or on the radar picture for some days to come. So nice and quiet as we head through your Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday is going to start out chilly, but we will hit around 50 degrees for most areas, save for once you get over here towards the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. And as we move into Thursday, seeing around the mid 50s even in spots, especially on the other side of the mountains. Tighter, sorry. Get it, get it, get it tighter.
I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Nice and quiet for the next couple of days. We're going to continue to be watching Wednesday, Thursday for a little more than just some sunshine across the area. That's about all we're going to have with just a few wisps of clouds. Once we head into your Wednesday, though, it will be stepping up in the temperatures, starting out chilly, hitting around the 50s or so. Thursday will be even warmer with highs in the low to mid 50s, 40s just up the coast into Long Island, New York. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Your Wednesday is going to start out sunny and it will stay that way even into your Thursday. Not much to talk about for the next couple of days. We will be watching our temperature trend quite a bit though. It's going to be uh, moving up into the, around the 50 degree mark as we move through your Wednesday afternoon. Thursday, even warmer, just a few clouds passing by. We'll see those mild temperatures sticking around all the way into your weekend. Too short. I went so quick. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll continue to see the sunshine for your Wednesday and even into your Thursday. The weather pattern has been pretty quiet and we will continue this until we get a little bit later into the week. Temperatures are on the rise. We'll be trending up to around 50 degrees for highs in the Baltimore area. The whole Delmarva region is going to be warming up to more mild temperatures around 55 degrees in Richmond. We'll even hit the upper 50s back to the west. Still hanging on to the 40s up towards New York, Long Island and Boston.